And there's no denying that people all over the world play our great Highland bagpipes. But by the time we got the pipes in Scotland, around 600 years ago, they were already well known in many other parts of the world. It's so deeply associated with Scotland, it's almost impossible to, to shed that. However, history tells us that piping was ubiquitous. The whole of Europe, every single country in Europe. Piping, it wasn't just a common instrument, it was the instrument. You couldn't get married, you couldn't um, have fun, you couldn't do any dancing without a piper. Piping is global, and not only is it global, but it goes back to the very beginnings of, of history. To better understand this instrument and get to the heart of what it means to other people around the world, we need to embark on a bit of an odyssey. It's always fascinated me how people were inspired to make music from the most basic materials. I mean, who on earth came up with the idea of a bagpipe in the first place? But the bagpipe is so old that its early days are a bit of a mystery. They may have first been played in the Middle East or developed in Egypt. But one of the earliest written references dates from around 425 BC and comes from here, in Greece. It's believed that the Greeks may have been amongst the first people ever to have played the bagpipes. And here on the island of Santorini, one of the most primitive sets of pipes still being played today is undergoing somewhat of a revival. And if you thought the Scottish pipes were a bit old school, then think again. The tambuna has been played for centuries as part of the traditional music of the Aegean Islands, but it's rarely heard today outside of rural areas. And on this island, the tradition has been mainly kept alive by one man. Yanis Pantazis is one of only a handful of professional tambuna makers. Yanis has made his own collection of bone flutes and double pipes that show some of the oldest methods that humans have used to make music. And these were played long before a bag was ever added. So, my dear friend, I have some tricks to show you. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Very excited. This is a single blade reed made out of cane. So, is that basically the air passing over that? And, the, and it vibrates? Yes, mm. and creates a sound. For sure, we don't know how old this technology is when humans invented and, that. And why they invented it? What was the necessity? It's about art and expression. These double pipes are the ancestor of the bagpipe. But to keep a steady note, you have to be able to blow out and breathe in at the same time. But add a bag to the pipe, and it suddenly becomes easier to play for longer and significantly louder. So, here is the tambuna, one of the most primitive types of bagpipe in uh, the world. And Yanis has some pretty interesting theories about what the sound of the tambuna represents. This sound, it's tragic, it has a sense of tragedy inside it. It's Greek, tragodia. Tragos is the male goat and Odi is lament. So Dragodia is the lament of the male goat. The lament of the goat. The lament of the goat. Well, I've heard the sound of the pipes described in many ways, but that's a new one on me. This is the tragedy. <laughs> now we're going to one of my suppliers. Yana 
Lewis makes his own tambunas from local materials, following a centuries-old tradition. It's quite a process and reveals the basics of how many bagpipes were made in the past. The goat skins for the bag are provided by local shepherds, such as Mihailis. <laughs> so this is another set of pipes okay. about to be. Uh, he's helping me. Zabuna, <laughs> zabuna. Michalis, how do you feel uh, when you hear the sound of the of the tampuna? In an organ, it's a buna. He says that the tampuna is nature itself. It's not industrial materials. It's handmade from nature. Yeah, to us. A good thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> When he hears the tambuna, he remembers his grandfather. And when he hears that instrument, his soul is free. Almost as crucial as the goat skins is getting the cane to make the all important reeds. I'm going to make some reeds out of that. Mm -hmm. The next stage of the process is washing the skin in the sea, using the salt to cure and purify it before leaving it to dry. It's a fairly primitive way to make an instrument. And in the 1930s, the tambuna was even temporarily banned for portraying a backward image of Greece. Primitive as it is, there's still a lot of skill that goes into the making of these instruments. And like many woodwood instruments, the DNA of the tambuna begins with a simple reed. The most difficult part, the reed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Get to work. Get to work. I hear you. <laughs> I never saw this coming this morning. Okay. It just fascinates me that, I mean, this is just a piece of cane. Yeah. And who suddenly found out, it's amazing, that by splitting it and blowing on it, it would vibrate. Now you're going to find out also, like your ancestor. We don't have a sound now. When you don't have a sound, you start shaving, it shaving down. From, uh, from the top. Yeah. <laughs> So, you have your reed, which makes the sound. You then insert that into a chanter, which is responsible for the melody. We'll be inside. I mean, you're not using a gauge or anything, just your eye. Positioning and size of the finger holes is important because that determines the musical scale. There we go. You see right. if it's equal? What do you think? What do you think? Very <laughs> proud of myself. And lastly, we tie a blowpipe and the chatter into the bag. The moment that we all been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> the most beautiful moment, it is when you put it for the first time. Yeah. So, Phil, this is our result. <laughs> yes. And give it a try. So. Doesn't matter what you're going to play, it's going to sound like a goat. <laughs> so, it's going to sound good. think of the Scottish pipes? It's loud and proud. <laughs> Inside here there's a nation's uh, voice. What tips would you give me to try and capture the essence of the tambuna? It has a voice that goes a long way back. Treat her like a history 
in the present time. So, I have to admit, I'm not really sure how I'm going to tame the tragic sound of the tambona and work it into this bagpiping composition I'm trying to write. I always think of the Highland Pipes as being quite old as an instrument, but they sound positively of today versus these instruments that I'm hearing. The tambuna, I mean, it's, it's, it wails like some ancient creature. It's very primitive, and it's definitely powerful. I can't say with 100% conviction that I'm a huge fan of the sound. Um, but I know what the sound is trying to do. It's, it's, it's imitating. It's the sound of the goat. It's always really interesting to see the beginnings of something that you're already familiar with, the origins of it. From its ancient beginnings in the East, the sound of the bagpipe began to migrate all through Europe. By the late Middle Ages, it was the music of everyday life. And it's not just Scotland where the bagpipe is considered the national folk instrument. The instrument is called Dudelsack in, in German. Bagpipes have been a part of the musical culture in Germany and Austria since very, very early ages, even in the ninth century. We are playing this traditional Estonian bagpipe that is called Torubil. It used to be really, really popular. They played it in weddings, in parties, in the work time, and uh, it was one of the most uh, beloved instruments before the fiddle game. Bulgarian piping tradition, it moves from the highly sophisticated to the quite populist. I do like the proverb in Bulgaria which says that uh, no wedding is a feast without a bagpipe. From the 1300s, it seems that most regions in Europe had their very own style of bagpipe. And the pipes provided the soundtrack to people's lives, loves, superstitions and beliefs. But today, traditional bagpipes often only survive in the nooks and crannies of rural areas. And in some places, it's still possible to see just how the bagpipes and religious beliefs were once intertwined, such as here in Italy. The most famous bagpipe in the mountains of central and southern Italy is the Zamponia. And if you thought the Greek tambuna was a sight to behold, well, things are about to get a whole lot goatier. The Zamponia has always been most closely associated with shepherds and was traditionally played at Christmas and religious festivals. And here in San Gregorio Magno, the shepherds and Zamponiari are getting ready for an important ceremony to celebrate San Vito, painting their goats in preparation for a huge parade around the town tomorrow. Yeah, I love the goat, I love what you've done with it. You know, I've, I've spent some wild Saturday afternoons in my life, but this takes the biscuit. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, I've made a terrible error. 
Yeah, well, I, I think the colours are supposed to be the Italian flag. This should have been red. I've never been this up close and personal with a goat before. We need some red now, yeah? Oh, I tell you, I feel like I'm being allowed to take part in something really special. This is amazing. Yes, Patar. In Caesino, the Chang and Giage, the Moiruiere, the Luzca, the Champaladret. Around these parts, Vito Leo is one of the oldest and most respected Zamponia makers. He's been making his instruments for 55 years, but he's worried that fewer people are playing them these days. So, I just tell him that this is not a good thing. They don't buy it anymore. Per me sì, io in Giappone sembra una passione, quando faceva la novella, il fronte, il presepe si muoveva da piangere. Il suo luca sembra la zamboglia, si muoveva, brisa la terra. Vito finds it difficult to play the zampogna himself anymore because of health problems, but his love for the sound of the instrument is as strong as ever. Do, do you miss it? Do you miss playing? Ma quando faccio la biglia a Giappone, quando la biglia a Giappone, se non ce la faccio a mandare con il piano. L'avvertimento che ti fa, che in genere ci tiene il cuore del suono, che si allegra la vita. But just because you're a fan of one bagpipe, it doesn't necessarily make you a fan of them all. What do you think of the Scottish bagpipes? Già mi sono arrivato, sono arrivato. Non so, più bella, quella è più una cosa violentissima, quella come la suona. Preparations are almost finished for tomorrow's religious festival, and the zampogna is still proudly celebrated here in San Gregorio Manuel, and a key ingredient of such occasions. This whole festival is about St. Vito, Sam Vito, and he's the patron saint or the protector against things like, amongst other things, against things like animal attacks and oversleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Not much chance of that around here this morning. The centre point of the festival is La Torniata. Shepherds come from miles around to herd their animals around the church three times. And if one of the animals enters the church, it brings extra luck for the year ahead. After completing three laps of this, these are going, they're going to be blessed by the priest. They'll be sprinkled with holy water, and that'll be their task done for the day. The Zampogna players provide the soundtrack to the occasionally chaotic proceedings. This is a bit like what they get up to in Pamplona, but instead of running with bulls, I appear to be stumbling with goats. Although the Zamponia is mostly associated with religious festivals here in southern Italy, the bagpipes haven't always had such a harmonious relationship with the church. The pipes have always had pagan associations. Goats were associated with the lustful figure of Pan. And one way or another, the pipes roused people's passions, and this did not endear them to the church. Bagpipes were often portrayed as playing the devil's music. 
they also earned some interesting depictions. What is immediately evident there is this discrepancy between the instrument being played by angels, part of the heavenly choirs, and instruments being played by uh, pigs, for example, or animals, um, suggesting the moral message of glutton and desire and unacceptable emotions. Associations between bagpipes and the supernatural became even more common after the Reformation. And there were references to the devil's music back home in Scotland as well. In the poem Tam O'Shanter, Robert Burns actually portrays the devil as a piper. On his way home from a heavy session, Tam stumbles upon a coven of witches dancing wildly in the churchyard, with the devil himself providing the music. There sat old Nick in shape of beast. He then goes on to say, he screwed the pipes and got them scurled till roof and rafters are the devil. The Zampogna is linked with poverty here in Italy because the shepherds who played these bagpipes were often forced to leave the land and travel far from home in search of work, carrying their pipes with them. In fact, in the mid-1800s, so many of them ended up busking in the streets of London that there was a campaign to get them banned. A big part of this journey for me is to try to reinvent how people perceive the bagpipes. And my next encounter is with a man who has been trying to do just that with the Zampogna. I'm heading to Scapoli, the capital of the Zampogna, to meet uh, Piero Ricci, the so-called enfant terrible of the instrument. I've come to see Piero play live, and lo and behold, there's not a goat in sight. He's made it his mission to change old, negative attitudes towards the Zampogna and make new audiences fall in love with it. The Zampogna traditional forse si ripete un po' troppo. E ho deciso di costruirle da solo. Piero has redesigned the instrument itself to make it more musically flexible. Questo mi ha spinto a bucare, a fare degli esperimenti. Il rozzampogna tradizionale, in fondo, ha dei tasti, sei, sei tasti bianchi. Su questa mia zampogna, io ho dato la possibilità quindi di avere non soltanto i tasti bianchi, ma anche quelli neri. Non bisogna vergognarsi, io dico, delle, delle proprie origini, di ciò che si ha. Mia madre quando parla con gli amici, con le amiche, dico, dice sempre che suono la fisarmonica, non la zampogna. My mother was so embarrassed that I played the accordion that she told people I worked in a swimming pool. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recording Piero to try and get a few ideas for my bagpipe composition. I think it's a, a tremendously difficult thing to, to play. It's, it's a real one of these jobs, you know, rubbing your belly, patting your head at the same time. Um, but just the, the extra intricacies that he's put into that, I have no idea how he's coordinating lungs, uh, fingers, and, and, you know, bellows pressure. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Bella, bella. <laughs> eh, okay. <laughs> Bye. Can't you roll it again? Bye. More, 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 more. more. <laughs> it's never going to happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, okay. We never did anyone any harm. Okay, okay. <laughs> I really admire how Pierre has managed to reinvent this humble shepherd's instrument. And I have a feeling I may have found a collaborator for my bagpipe piece. But now it's time for us to move on to the next chapter of this bagpipe odyssey. And if you're still unconvinced about the power of the pipes, well, come to Spain and join the party. Because for most of the last millennium, the bagpipe was the instrument people turned to when they wanted to celebrate. And it wasn't just shepherds that played the pipes. In the 12 and 1300s, bagpipes were predominantly played by buskers and minstrels. Travelling musicians, people not too dissimilar to myself, I suppose. And I imagine that they would have had the reputation for being the mad, bad, dangerous to be with rock and rollers of the times. And if there's one place I don't have to convince anyone about the importance of the bagpipe, it's here in Galicia. The gaita is to the north of Spain, what the guitar and flamenco are to the south. And here, in Ortiguera, one of Spain's biggest music festivals, the streets are crammed with gaita bands. The gaita's enjoying a renaissance at the moment, a real renaissance, just here in Galicia, but it's seen the popularity of the instrument go right across the world. Today, gaita players such as Carlos Nunez have become internationally famous. But, like most bagpipes, the gaita has had a bit of a turbulent history. Galician culture went through a dark age for many centuries until it began to be revived in the 1800s. The Gaita was one of the muses of this revival, but it would suffer again under Franco's dictatorship when regional identities were suppressed. Today, the instrument remains crucial to the Galician sense of identity, beloved as one of the key symbols that makes them different to the rest of Spain. Desde pequeña me gustó el sonido que tiene y el sonido de tierra gallega. I think it's a feeling really exciting because you are uh, representing the uh, your city or your your land. Llevamos muy arraigado todo lo relacionado con la música y con la tradición de nuestros antepasados y nos juntamos todos para poder eh, rememorar lo que ellos hacían. I'm really impressed by how many young people you see playing the gaita here. But these big gaita bands are a relatively recent phenomenon becoming popular after the instrument's revival in the 1970s. Before then, the gaita was mostly played solo or with a single drummer. These bands were largely inspired by the model of our pipe bands in Scotland. An innovation that came under fire from some folks who believed it a step too far from tradition. I have to admit, there's definitely more of a fiesta vibe to the marching bands here. There's something really fundamental about the way the human brain responds to the combination of a simple drone and a melody. It's a combination that seems to have the ability to move both mind and body.
The drone is normally the steady bass note of the bagpipes that underpins the melody. As well as adding harmony, it adds volume and breadth and is the defining characteristic of the instrument. There is something fundamentally magical about the drone. It has an effect on us, on our bodies. It, 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 it goes straight in there. You're either a drone person or you're not. If you're a drone person, you're almost, well, you are physically drawn to the sound of it. That combination of that note that doesn't change and the note that does will produce a different emotional response. And one player who is a master at getting emotion out of the gaita is Christina Pato. My way of playing bagpipes is very different from the traditional Galician way of playing them. Having an, a bagpipe right here all the time that sweats with you, that dances with you, having the freedom of an instrument that can breathe, that can feel. I am kind of addicted to it. The drum is the key, actually. It's, it's what makes a bagpipe a bagpipe. That double life, like that two sides of the human being, but of the sound too, like having this constant sound down there that connects you, that keeps you grounded. And then all the lines that are flowing and that you embellish and that you start growing. Ten years ago, Christina moved to New York, where she's also a member of Yo-Yo Ma's Silk Road Ensemble. She's continued to push the gaita in all sorts of different directions, including classical and jazz. When you play an instrument that is so deeply connected to the cultural identity of a community, which is the case of the gaita, you have that in the back of your mind, that even if you don't want to, you are representing a community. In my case, I'm representing Galicia. There is this thought in the back of my mind that I don't know how this is going to be seen in my community. And, and these two thoughts of, I really want to show the instrument to the rest of the world because it's fascinating and it's amazing. And the thought of, oh, I'm taking it too much away from where it belongs. The way of understanding a traditional instrument is the roughness of the sound. It makes the connection even deeper. Yeah, it's like the perfect instrument. It's a pity that it's so loud. <laughs> It's fantastic to see how the bagpipe is flourishing here in Galicia. And I hope the composition that I'm writing will be able to reflect some of the emotion and sense of fun that seems to come so naturally here. I love it here in Galicia. I, I, I always have a fabulous time. I think it's because they're so like us. They're so like the Scots. They're, they're, they feel like kindred spirits. Their music is very like ours. There's a, a total connection. And, you know, they have a real serious side to them. They can be very emotional people. But, you know, the majority of their music is just absolutely unashamedly cheery. They weren't allowed to celebrate their own culture for such a long time. And now that they are allowed to do it, they're doing it with the biggest heart that you ever saw in your life. The gaita is actually pretty similar to how a medieval bagpipe might have sounded. 
but during the Baroque period of the 17th century, some branches of the bagpipe family would become increasingly refined. And trust the French to add a few touches of sophistication to what was still primarily a peasant instrument. The French musette was a favourite of Louis XIV, and the folk music of the countryside became the chamber music of the court. These types of pipes were designed to be blown by bellows instead of by mouth, partly to save the court aristocrats from overexerting themselves. And this was arguably when the bagpipe was at its most respectable. The main thing for us is the emotional thing in a tune. Okay, this is absolutely what we look for. And we love when women cry. But new styles of music were beginning to make the bagpipe unfashionable. And the very element which gives the bagpipe much of its glory, the drone, was also threatening to sign its death warrant. It boils down to fashion. Musical fashion moves towards melody with a free bass. Where Corelli and Handel are, are, are top of the pops. That's what people want to hear. It's the new fashionable thing. The bagpipe begins to struggle. It can't do that sort of music because it's got this fixed drone. That harmonic language is incompatible with bagpipes. That's why their status and the professionalism of their players collapses all over Europe. If the bagpipe was going to survive, it would have to keep adapting. And by the late 1700s, a bagpipe had been developed, which is arguably the most sophisticated and complicated there is. And if the Scottish pipe soundtracked my childhood dreams, then it was the sound of the Irish Illan pipe, which first fueled my teenage dreams of becoming a musician. And here in Ireland, it's synonymous with the sound of traditional music. I remember hearing them for the first time and thinking, what on earth is it that's making that incredible sound? 37 years down the line, here I am still wondering what it is about that sound that got so far under my skin. Illan means elbow, as these pipes are blown by a bellows held under the arm. They have a range of two octaves, meaning that they're more musically flexible compared with the nine notes available to older pipes. It's said that they take a full 21 years to master, of which the first seven are required to save to actually buy a set. And there's one Ellen Piper who perhaps more than anyone else inspired me to want to become a traditional musician in the first place, Liam O'Flynn. Lovely. When I first heard the Ellen Pipes, it was yourself I okay. heard, that I heard. Uh, and it was life-changing for me. Um, I had never heard the sound before. It kind of turned on a little switch in me. Right. And I suppose I can almost, you know, hand on heart, blame you for what I'm doing. Oh, I'm delighted. <laughs> what I'm doing today. <laughs> Liam is considered by many to be one of the greatest living players of the Ellen Pipes. He was a founding member of Planxty, one of the most influential Irish folk bands of all time, whose rapturously received reunion gigs showed their music had lost none of its spark. <laughs> Liam has offered to try and help unlock a few of the instrument secrets. The inner workings of the Ilan pipes. Yes. <laughs> but it is, it, the instrument basically has three elements. The most important is the chanter, and then 
are drones, and there are three drones that it creates that wonderful kind of floor under the, the music. We have the three uh, regulators, they're called. The regulators, they add lovely colour to the They do, to yeah. The yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that part of the, like one of the skills you would use to create emotion in a piece? Yes, and they can give a very stark, very powerful feel. It's a lot and to contend with. It's a lot to contend with, this kind of thing. I'm a bit of a novice when it comes to writing for the Ellen Pipes, so I'm wondering what advice Liam can offer me for my composition. One thing I became really aware of was the fact that I was part of a tradition and what a secure place it is to be, to be part of a tradition. It's a hard one thing, a tradition. It's important to be aware of that. The Ellen Pipe might be the most musically developed of the bagpipes, but it's also had a rocky journey. And by the 1950s, it was at risk of dying out entirely. One man who played a key role in keeping the instrument alive and also helped to make the sound of the Ellen Pipes famous across the world is Paddy Maloney, leader of the Chieftains. At that time when you were, when you were learning, were pipers still pretty thin on the ground? Pipers and Irish music, in fact, you know, to be seen walking down the street with a fiddle or a pipes under your arm, you know, your friends are billy ding, you know, they give you slagging, <laughs> you know, that, that's how it was in those early days, yeah. you know. Paddy was present at a famous meeting in 1968 when the Society of Ellen Pipers was founded to save the instrument. At that time, there were only an estimated 100 Ellen Pipers left. Today, there are about 6,000 Dillon Pipers across the globe. And few people have helped to showcase the instrument and join the dots between different musical traditions as much as the Chieftains. Wonderful! What do you uh, think it is about the sound that makes it so usable in, in other contexts? You know, it's not a piano. And, uh, yeah. But to me, it's, it's, it's to the human ear, that's a better scale. Yeah. And there's something about it that's lonesome. And you know, you do. <laughs> you know, even the reels or jigs are, uh, can make people cry. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit bluesy sounding, isn't it? It's a bluesy, you know, I mean. You can get into all sorts of things, all sorts of trolls. <laughs> if you want to get a sense of just how vibrant the Ellen Pipes are today, then it's hard to beat the annual Willie Clancy Festival. Held in Milltown Malby, on the west coast of County Clare. This is incredible. I've heard about this festival here um, in Milton Malby for, since I was about 16. It's the first time I've ever been here. And I've never seen so many sets of villain pipes all in the one place. It's just quite something else. Us Scots can sometimes be a bit ambivalent towards our pipes. So it's fascinating and inspiring to see how strongly the Irish feel about theirs. It has a, an effect on Irish people when they hear the pipes. It's a part of nature, Irish people's culture, it's a part of their history, it's a part of their being. It's everything about Irish people you can portray in a, in a tune on the island pipes. They just have this tone that grabs my heart and a lot of other people's hearts and uh, it just makes you 
Well, proud to be Irish and to, to play such a beautiful instrument. And you'd be surprised just how far some of these enthusiasts have traveled to be here. My name is Makoto Nakatsui. I'm from Sapporo, Japan. The sound of the pipes just captured me. Me llamo Alexander Suarez Mendes y vivo en La Habana, en Cuba. Lo único que tenía era algún CD de River Dance, eh, dos o tres canciones de, de System. Me gusta, me gusta el sonido, es increíble el sonido que tiene este instrumento. You have that body of sound coming from the chanter as well as the drones and the regulators. They're wrapped right around you, you're enclosed in the instrument. Here you can see that, that, that it's, a, it's a tradition that's alive and kicking, very much so. I'd just come out of a session where I was playing with uh, a guy from Cuba playing, <laughs> playing the Ellen Pipes with a young girl from Glasgow. So it's quite something. It's very clear for me that, uh, about the Irish Pipes. Um, if I hadn't been for them, I may not have been doing what I do for a living today. It's fantastic to see how strong and international the sound of the Ellen Pipes is today. But in some countries, the bagpipe tradition did die out almost entirely. <laughs> Believe it or not, 150 years before mention of the bagpipes in Scotland, there was another country already very familiar with them, England. And the Blowout Festival, held each year near Birmingham, is at the centre of the effort to bring this tradition back to life. And if you thought there was only one type of bagpipe, well, get ready. You have the border pipes. I've got the Leicestershire small pipes. The Lancashire bagpipe. There's the English great pipes. There's the Northumbrian small pipes. There's the Cornish double pipe. The Marwood double pipes. There's the Leicestershire pipe. <gasps> I think I run out there. Yeah, don't forget the Welsh pipes. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. They sound like the wail of a newborn babe when they come to life. They make this <laughs> sort of sound. The English bagpipe tradition has been reborn in the last few decades. Largely thanks to makers who used old pictures to reinvent sets of pipes that had become extinct. As to what they think of us in Scotland, I think um, in the early days there was a certain amount of amused tolerance. The world tends to see Scotland as the bagpipe, but when you scratch the surface, and I don't know, it's, it's interesting, in the last 30 years, all around Europe, simultaneously, there have been people interested in their own regional bagpipes. The beauty of the English revival is there's no one there to tell you you're doing anything wrong. They can say you don't, they don't like what you're doing, but there's, there's, there's not right or wrong. Some players have been building not just their own bagpipes, but creating their own musical styles. Been greatly affected by Baroque music and Renaissance music. Also by jazz rhythms. And by combining the two, the end result sort of sounds more like club music than anything else. <laughs> My whole approach has been not to play what the pipe is supposed to play, but uh, what it can play. What can this bagpipe actually do? Well, I've made it home to Scotland. 
and having seen the adventures the bagpipes have had over their long history, I'm in love with them more than ever. So far, we've seen their primitive beginnings. Explored their holy and sometimes devilish past. Discovered how this was the dance music of the Middle Ages. And learned how they've continued adapting in order to survive. It's amazing to see how many people in countries around the world feel just the same about their own bagpipes as I do about ours. But being Scottish, there really is no escape. It's always going to be the Highland pipes that stir my blood the most. In some ways, this pipe dream of mine has only just begun. I still have to write a piece of music that somehow does justice to this amazing instrument. And in order to do that, I have to explore the most impressive bagpipe tradition of them all, our very own. In the next episode, I'm going to find out how and why the Scottish bagpipes managed to become the most famous in the world. We'll see some of the weird and wonderful situations that the Highland Pipes have found themselves in over the years. And meet the new generation of players reinventing the pipes today. And maybe, just maybe, I might pull off this pipe dream of mine after all. <laughs>